Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. Happy Friday to you and yours. Uh, no Uncle Jimmy uh, again today. Uh, still dealing with some health issues. Uh, his chair sits empty as we continue to make sure that no booty juice from anyone else uh, gets in Uncle Jimmy's chair. Hopefully, uh, we'll have some good news on Uncle Jimmy over the weekend, and uh, he'll be rejoining us shortly. I do want to say this, though. Next week, man, do we have an awesome week planned for you next week. Shamok Show, Shamika Michelle, will be here live in Nashville. Uh, Steve Kim, my Asian brother from another mother, he'll be here live in Nashville. Leonidas Johnson. He's going to be here live in Nashville and Professor Delano, the smartest man on the show, Delano Squires, will be here live in Nashville in studio with me at some point during the week. They all won't be here on the same days, but at some point during the week, they'll all be here. I'm looking forward to that, uh, to have these guys in studio standing in the gap for uh, Uncle Jimmy and just Getting more familiar with home base here in uh, Nashville. Uh, I have a fantastic and awesome show planned for you today. The best show of the week is about to go down today right here on Friday. Uh, Steve Dace from the Steve Dace Show, he's going to join us later in the show and talk to us about COVID and these mandates and how he's basically analogizing these COVID mandates and vaccine mandates to the kind of stuff Nazis did in Germany. Can't wait to hear that. Uh, Steve Kim's going to be here. We'll talk some Thursday night football. Uh, we'll talk some college football. We'll talk some uh, Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, as well with Steve Kim. Kim. But uh, we're going to start today's show with a massive fire. I'm about to start. This is going to be my fire starter, best fire starter of my career. And then we're going to bring Delano in to help me control and use this blaze uh, to make further points and elaborate so that uh, I burn up everybody I want to. This is me being a fire-breathing dragon uh, from Game of Thrones style. So without further ado, let me get into my topic for today, my fire starter for the day. Uh, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg, they're the Hugh Hefner and Larry Flint of rap music. They're pornographers, all four of them. Hefner and Flint dominated the visual form of pornography. Dre and Snoop earned fame and fortune dominating lyrical pornography. You'll hear that as a harsh rebuke of the four horsemen of smut. But I am not a hypocrite. I wrote for Playboy magazine. In June of 2008, my name appeared on its cover alongside a lovely photo of a model, Jade Nicole. Years ago, I attended two parties at Hefner's mansion. I've socialized with women who graced the magazine's pages. Dr. Dre is the only celebrity who has made me feel starstruck. His mastery of music and beat amazes me. In the 1990s, I shook his hand at a Mike Tyson fight and mumbled a few words signifying my astonishment and admiration. I don't have a problem with Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Hugh Hefner, or Larry Flint. At one time, I adored and supported their work. Even today, in all honesty, and you guys know I keep it real, I'd have to categorize their art as an occasional guilty pleasure, a sin of solitude and seclusion. I do, however, have a problem with Dre and Snoop performing at halftime of the Super Bowl. Pornography and pornographers are unworthy of America's biggest stage. Yesterday, the NFL announced Dre, Snoop, Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, and R&B singer Mary J. Blige will perform at halftime of Super Bowl 56. The announcement was greeted as a historic moment of progress, a triumphant landmark in black culture. The country's strongest pop culture force, the NFL, the number one TV show on five different television networks, wrapped its arms around 
commercial hip hop music. The conservative and previously traditional NFL embraced the musical genre that defines the liberal NBA. Free at last, free at last. Thanks Sodom and Gomorrah, the NFL will let lyrical pornography blast. We can only hope that censors won't stop Dre, Snoop, Slim Shady, and Kendrick from repeatedly shouting bitch, ho, in front of 100 million Americans. Or maybe a Black Lives Matter flag will fly as Dre brags about never hesitating to put a on his back as gunfire blares in the background. This is not progress. This is not a great moment in American history, NFL history, or black history. The Super Bowl halftime will be a satanic ritual, a celebration of America's moral decay. I'm not saying that as an outsider, as someone with a severe disdain for hip hop music. I'm saying it as an insider. I'm saying it because I know the music quite well. I own virtually every song Dr. Dre ever produced. I know Snoop's catalog of music nearly as well. The same goes for Eminem. It's a musical collection of old Playboy and Hustler magazines. It's hedonism, materialism, immorality, and violence in rhyme form set to music. It's the soundtrack for a movie about Babylon. How did this happen? How did a country founded in Judeo-Christian values come to legitimize pornography and allow pornographers to sit atop our cultural throne? throne? Hefner and Flint never occupied the space Dre, Snoop, and Jay-Z shared. Despite their wealth, Hefner and Flint remained outsiders. They weren't public friends with presidents like Jay-Z and Barack Obama. They weren't center stage at major mainstream cultural events like Super Bowl 56. They were kept in their lane. They were pornographers, guilty pleasures to be experienced in the shadows. Hefner and Flint did not have the right complexion for the connection white liberals have afforded black rappers. The left has cleverly established race as America's new religion of choice replacing Christianity. Black is the highest denomination of the left's race religion. Their doctrine argues that bowing to blackness is a righteous and responsible response to America's history of racism. Anything framed as black cannot be chastised, criticized, or shunned. To do so would be blasphemous and racist. Through hip hop, Pornography has been wrapped in black packaging. Through hip hop, a self-destructive culture has been wrapped in black packaging. Music that promotes the degradation and exploitation of black people has been framed as the salvation and glorification of black people. No one can safely challenge this despicable orthodoxy. I watched a white female host on the NFL Network celebrate alongside Michael Irvin the announcement that Dre and Snoop would host the Pepsi Super Bowl halftime show. As she heard Snoop rap, that bitches ain't shit but hoes and tricks, lick on these nuts and suck <laughs> Does she remember Dre's lyrics on the NWA song, One Less Bitch? We're in the Me Too era and everyone is going to catch amnesia about Dr. Dre's violent assault on Dee Barnes in the 1990s. That's the power of the race religion. Dr. Dre is black. His history of violence towards women is irrelevant. Look, I'm all about forgiveness and people moving past their mistakes. I've certainly been allowed to move by, beyond mine. But Dre's 2015 album, Compton, featured Eminem rapping about making the women he rapes orgasm. The race religion is killing America. The Alphabet Mafia, BLM, LGBTQ, CRT, has wrapped every issue in black packaging. Earlier this week, Playboy Magazine promoted a bunny outfit using a young black man as the model. 
The gay and transgender issues have been framed as a black issue. We're being used to promote causes that defy God and the principles taught in the Bible. But you go right ahead and celebrate Dre and Snoop performing at halftime of the Super Bowl. Keep being a useful idiot in the race religion. Black power, baby. Have at it. I'm done with it. Uh, now, that is a fire. Uh, Want to air things out here before we bring Delano in? Fan these flames. Uh, Delano, I'm not real happy about Dre and Snoop uh, mm -hmm. being the performers at halftime of the Super Bowl. This is being celebrated as a great accomplishment. This is, hell, they'll, maybe they'll turn this into part of the Juneteenth celebration. I don't know, <laughs> but am I wrong for... Uh, complaining about this and seeing this as as a giant symbol towards the country's moral decay. We're putting pornographers on America's biggest stage. I don't think you're wrong at all, Jason. Honestly, I think um, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the difference between, um, you know, Larry Flynn and Hugh Hefner and and the the, the hip hop artist that you name, right? Those people, even though they were famous, they were never mainstreamed by uh, cultural elites. Right. So Ronald Reagan wasn't going to bring Larry Flint to to the, the White House and, and celebrate him um, in the way that um, President Obama has done with Jay-Z. So I think the, the fact that um, so many black elites and black leaders have embraced some of the worst elements of hip hop culture. Right. Even though they, they don't live that way, but they will say that the music is empowering, um, makes the, the influence that these artists have that much more dangerous to the, to the community at, at large. And it's not just their influence on the black community. Right. It's just uh, across the board, across the country. Um, these guys are used to promote products. Right. They're pitchmen. They, uh, you know, the face of, of you know, um, different movements and. All of those things have an effect because and we've talked about this all the time in life, what you uh, reward and encourage, you get more of. And the unfortunate truth is that for the better part of the last 30 years, um, our elites and particularly in the black community have rewarded and encouraged people like Dr. Dre and, and Snoop Dogg. And I think the NFL is just following in their path. And I, and I like the fact that you, you talked about Jay-Z's involvement here and tying that to you know, his deal with the NFL and, and you know, sort of the, the broader um, Black Lives Matter movement, which, to your point, sees um, anything that black people do as, as above criticism, at least in, in, the, in the public sphere and, and, you know, from mainstream elites. I don't want to let the white power structure that controls the music industry, Hollywood, the NFL, popular culture... I can't let them off the hook here. And 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 because and, look, I look at Dre, Snoop, Jay-Z, all hey, I look no different than uh Larry Flint and Hugh Hefner, Bob Guccione that started Penthouse magazine. Larry Flint, for those of you who don't know, started Hustler magazine. I think most people know of Hefner and his association with Playboy. The the rappers are pornographers. And and mm. In a free society, you're going to have pornographers. But the institutions, the mainstream institutions, the gatekeepers of what's appropriate and what's normalized mm. never would have let some white guys, in my view, become this mainstream promoting pornography. You're going to let them have their money, let them, have, let them be celebrated in the shadows, but I think this is intentional and have believed for a long time in the music industry that we keep throwing up the rappers and giving them an importance that's completely undeserved. They're seen as spokesmen and oh my, anybody that, again, if you're just a local rapper in some city, there will be a news story, rapper shot, rapper arrested, as if somehow being a rapper is this really prestigious job 
And so would they, let's say, and maybe they would, would there be headlines, pornographer shot, pornographer, hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, does this or that. I, I just don't see it. But somehow the, the, the gatekeepers, the puppet masters of the culture have decided that black rappers are some of the most important people on the planet. And yep. let's put them on the biggest stage and have them out there as a symbol of what black culture represents. And I'm just, and again, I'm not denying that I've listened to the music, enjoyed the music, partied to the music. I'm not denying that. But I never wanted to see it on the main stage and as the representative of our culture, because right. I guarantee that white people wouldn't let Hugh Hefner and Larry Flint define white culture. I agree. And, and to your point, right, the, the people who control, you know, those power structures know exactly what they're doing. Not only that, they their low, their soft bigotry of low expectations, right? Um, is evident because they see the target of you know the lyrics that the that the rappers produce as primarily being black women. So when rappers call you know women as you said bitches and, and hoes and tricks and all this other stuff, the execs that run these companies never think oh he's talking about my daughter. They think oh he's he's talking about his you know his own daughter right he's, he's the women in his own community. I have a hard time believing that they would take the same approach to this music and this culture if the rappers ever trained their eyes and their and their um, lyrical content on the execs themselves and their families and their mothers and their daughters. So um, I, I agree with you. I, I it, it's it, it really is you know frustrating to see how so much of how we talk about you know, sex and, and, and gender and even in the era of Me Too has changed. But, you know, no one seems to, to care about, you know, how this culture has morphed and really sort of entrenched itself right in the middle of, you know, mainstream American culture for, you know, the better part of 30 years. And as I said, when you when you reward people financially, um, when you reward them culturally, when you uh, provide them social esteem and social status, for promoting violence and degrading women and and glorifying drug abuse you shouldn't be surprised when you get more of that and the reason and a lot and i can hear the critics now they'll say oh well the, the majority of people who buy hip-hop are white you know white suburban kids and i mean i i haven't even looked at the data recently to see if that's still the case but ultimately it doesn't matter because if we operate from the assumption that representation matters and, and kids want to be what they see, then we should believe that the people who are most likely to want to emulate the artists or the ones who look like them. Because that's the argument people make when it comes to, you know, wanting to see more black doctors or black lawyers or engineers or vice president or, you know, any other elected office. It's that no, the 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 young black kids who are in there, you know, in grade school today will look up one day and they'll see President Obama and they'll want to emulate him. OK, well, if we believe that, then we also have to believe that the opposite is true, that those same kids who see people like Snoop Dogg, who and I know we're going to get to it in my own column. I, I talked about, you know, the, the, his, his lyrical content, the fact that he once showed up to an award show with two women um, on leashes and, and dog collars. Um, the fact that R. He Kelly about, you're talking about. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm talking about Snoop Dogg. Oh, Snoop. I'm sorry. Yeah. S yeah. Snoop yeah. Dogg. Um, he showed up to, to an award show with two women on, on dog collars and leashes. He bragged about being a pimp um, and described the women that he was pimping. It was a, a steady stream of, of B's and H's, right, for about three minutes. Um, even up to last year, right, in, in case people think, oh, well, you're just, you know, nitpicking Snoop's historical record. After the tragic death of Kobe Bryant, when, when Gail King um, interviewed, I want to say it was Lisa Leslie, and asked some questions about, you know, Kobe's, you know, uh, old rape case and how he would be remembered, right? Snoop responded with a video where he called Gail King, and again, excuse my language audience, 
a funky dog head bitch. That was his response to Gail King. Noted journalist and obviously, you know, best friend of Oprah Winfrey. Um, he also, at least in my opinion, implied a threat to her in terms of if you don't stop, we're going to come get you. And for a guy that has professed an affiliation with the Crips for, again, over 30 years, that actually means something. And I mean, the response from certainly from the mainstream was tepid at best. Snoop has not, you know, suffered any social penalties for that. He still gets to smoke weed with Martha Stewart. He still gets to pitch products. Um, so when when Don Imus makes uh, an inappropriate comment about black women, his career and his reputation is forever linked to that specific comment. But when Snoop Dogg does it, even, as I said, up until last year, he suffers no real penalty. He said he talked to his mom. His mom told him he's out of line. He gave some half-hearted apology, and that was it. Everybody moved on. So it, it's clear that both, you know, within sort of the, the, the white liberal mainstream as well as the black liberal mainstream, um, neither party sees these people and the culture that they promote as, as a problem for the rest of society. And what you're really talking about, Delano, is, is something I'm trying to open people's minds to. We're being used to change yes. America dramatically. Black people and the issue of black race and racism is the packaging that every issue, LGBT and transgender issues are all attached to race and blackness because the left has figured out if you put it in the packaging of blackness, no one can question Criticize anything. It, right. And so if you want to make it so that a, 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 a human being, a, man, a, a biologically born man can go compete against young girls in track and field or whatever sport he wants, package it in blackness and say, oh, this is our black people are, are queer and uh, transgender people and they're at risk and they're low. Put this black umbrella over it and no one can say a word. And, and they've done it with the LGBT issue. Mm -hmm. That's why black men are the face of the gay movement. And, and, and if anybody wants to, anybody with a religious backbone or upbringing at all, they want, you know, I'm not that comfortable with same sex marriage. Well, you're racist right. and, or, or, or you're homophobic, which is akin to racism. They've all been packaged together and the, I'm t this morning I was talking about because, you know, all my friends are guys I played college football with uh, and we're on the text string together. And, and before I could even say a word on the text string, it pops up. One of my friends, mm -hmm. smart guy, successful guy, whatever. He was already playing the race card on the Super Bowl halftime deal. And mm. was saying, oh, you know, basically he was saying that, you know, white guys won't be comfortable with this and blah, blah, inferring, but not directly, but he was inferring that they're racist and that's the only reason why they would be uncomfortable with this. And, and I'm just like, wow, man, this dude got a daughter. Mm. And he's list he knows this music as well as I do. Mm -hmm. But because he's, his vision and his thoughts have been so clouded by race, that's all he can think about. It's like, oh my God, Snoop and Dre, they're black. And, and, and this is something for black people. And so who cares? If they put out music that denigrated my daughter, my ex-wife, mm -hmm. who, who cares that whatever they said about my mama, sisters, any of that, who cares that they put out music that has defined us as criminal thugs? This is a sign of racism that people are uncomfortable with. And they're, they're gonna sing clean versions of their song. And so let's ignore it. Let, let's ignore the fact that we, we are mainstreaming an immorality that defines this country and our entire culture. And, and this is why white people have to, they can't sit on the sidelines on this issue because this race religion that they've created and, and, and making blackness the highest denomination of this race religion, it's the tool they're using Mm -hmm. to dramatically change this country in ways that I'm just sorry, if you're a believer 
or have any sense of morality at all, you just can't be this. Com- and, 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 and look, my friends and anybody that knows me knows that I, I'm a sinner. But, but, but damn it, all this stuff just being mainstream and, yeah. and, and acting like there should be no shame around any of it. I, I'm, we're Babylon. We're Sodom yeah. and Gomorrah. We deserve whatever destruction and hell is rained down upon us. The NFL and the Super Bowl is the biggest stage America has. 100 million people are going to watch that game. Hundred and I think the ratings may get peak during halftime. And, and we're sending out Snoop and Dr. Dre. We're sending out Hugh Hefner and Larry Flint. Here, mm. here, America, this is who best entertains you and represents the culture we've created. I'm... I'm just, I'm at a loss for thought, word. I, 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 so half of me feels like giving up. I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I can't believe I'm living in this time. Yeah, I'd, I'd like for the, to the, for the audience to do like a, you know, a quick thought experiment and to ask how likely it would be that the NFL would bring on a um, distinctly public, Christian artist to perform on the halftime show. I'm not saying somebody who says, you know, be I'm a good person. I walk grandma across the street. I know. I mean, someone who publicly declares that, you know, Jesus Christ came to save sinners and that he is the Lord of all. And if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all or whoever. Right. Even if it was a rapper, even if it was someone like Bizzle or, or a rapper like Trip Lee. Right. How unlikely it is that the NFL would bring on someone like that. But when it comes to this other religion, they have no problem with their high priests and high priestesses. They have no problem promoting their values, right? Because in, in many respects, this, this is where our society is. It, it has degraded, it has decayed. Um, that which is used to be normal is now... Um, on the fringes and that which was on the fringes has now been normalized. And as you said, I I think you hit the nail on the head. These people are using um, blackness and and racial identity um, almost like a a protective covering to go around whatever other agenda they're trying to push. You mentioned LGBT. Um, um, There's also abortion. Every time abortion gets, gets brought up, you know, whether it's in the culture or in the halls of Congress, right after they talk about abortion. And, and I saw I actually saw a video of this yesterday with, you know, Representative Cory Bush and Ayanna Presley. It's always about um, black women and other marginalized women and queer folk and, and non-binary people. But I'm like, why, why is why is their conversation about abortion always centered around black women? Right. They did it even um, uh, last, <clears throat> excuse me, last year in the height of the pandemic, when when one magazine put you know two plus size models on on the cover and they said you know this is what a healthy body looks like, you know, they know that one of the, the models was was black because they know that if people criticize um, that cover or that model, much as is the case with Lizzo, they'll say fat phobia is a is a function of white supremacy. So wh- whatever. Um, disorder or dysfunction they want to promote on a given day to your point they know that wrapping it in blackness uh, gives them you know a certain level of protection against criticism Um, and I wish more people would wake up to that because they they are doing that strategically and they're also playing on our on our history so that's why every new movement is the new civil rights movement and they know that if they use that language it's a lot easier to get black folk on board because many of us, like anyone else, we want to feel like good, decent people. And we think it's indecent to secure rights for ourselves and then be told that we're denying them to somebody else. Um, and, I, and I think that is an Achilles heel in the black community that is being attacked relentlessly by the powers that be. Um, and white liberals take advantage of that all the time. And I, I said in one of my last columns, one of the reasons it's a lot harder for them to um, scare Hispanic folks in the same way is because th- there's no Jaime Crow for them to talk about, 
right? There's no uh, Spanish Selma for them to draw on. Because you're talking about people who come from different countries with different cultures. The only thing that unites them really is a language, which is Spanish. But there's, they can't manipulate them in the same way they try to manipulate black folk. <coughs> um, and I think the other thing I, that I want to add re- really, really quick is in the last two weeks, we've seen that these people do have limits to what they believe rappers should say. Because when Nicki Minaj or Busta Rhymes even questions their position on COVID, now it's these dumb rappers just need to shut up. And, and the white people who don't agree with the rappers in terms of the culture that they promote are white supremacists. So they, they clearly are able to, to reason morally. It's just that they, they, the people that I'm talking about, the, the Joy Reeds, the, the, you know, the folks at the NFL who are promoting this stuff, um, they just promote the wrong things. And I think that's, that's the biggest issue. I'm so glad you brought up the abortion topic and issue because it was on display yesterday. You mentioned Mm -hmm. uh, Miss Presley, Ayanna Presley. Direct quote, abortion laws are anti-trans and based in white supremacy. These misguided bans will not actually prevent all abortions. They simply put safe and necessary abortion care out of the reach of our most vulnerable, specifically our lowest income sisters, our queer, trans, and non-binary siblings, black, Latina X, AAPI, whatever the hell that is, uh, immigrants, disabled, indigenous folks, and none of this is happenstance. Rashida Tlaib, this is what she had to say yesterday. Uh, Black Lives Matter should be at the forefront for every policy that we ever do in this country. She's talking Mm. about abortion, but somehow (laughs) this is a Black Lives Matter issue, although, what, they're killing 20, 30 million black babies a year. So this, to me, sounds like a a Black Death Matter issue more than a Black Mm. Lives Matter issue. Uh, But she went on the Black Lives Matter should be at the forefront of every policy that we ever do in this country. It can't just be carrying a sign or being on a commission. You actually have to stand up. I want to tell you something. Over 40% of the deaths from COVID in my state are my black neighbors, even though they make up less than 14% of the total population. We're talking about abortion. She's turned it into COVID. She's turned it into Black Lives Matter. They're playing a game. Yeah. This is so obvious. They're using race. It's it's the red uh, flag or towel right. they wave in front of a bull. Of bull. Look yep. over here and ignore the reality, and we keep going for it. And, and I just, I, I don't know. You, 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 you hit on something, right? In, in terms of since Roe versus Wade, the, the estimates um, are that about 20 million black babies have been aborted since Roe versus Wade, you know, was handed down by the Supreme Court. But the, it, it, it really is frustrating. Because we are being led, and I'm talking about the American public, by people who are so completely inept and mediocre, right, that it's just becoming more and more obvious. They run to the same four or five talking points. All they see is race. It informs their entire worldview. They, they lack such self-awareness that they promote abortion, which again is the, the taking of innocent life in the womb as something that uh, uh, aligns with Black Lives Matter. So even, even people who, who may describe themselves as pro-choice understand the, the, the inherent, um, you know, just, what's the word I'm looking for? Paradox of that particular- Depravity. Of that, oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's the depravity, but, but when you put those two things together, right? Killing more black babies gotcha. promotes more black lives. Those two, two things are incompatible. But for whatever reason, these are the people that we keep, elect, keep electing. These are the people who have become the voice of the Democratic Party. And even though, you know, you have Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer who have more power on paper, the ideological trajectory of the Democratic Party is, is rests with um, Tlaib and Presley and Omar and, and AOC. And 
I don't even know what comes next because they're, they're, they're not even trying to hide it anymore. They're out in the open. Kill more black babies it, it, and support it or you're a white supremacist. And, and that does not make sense. Here's where I think you're wrong. You started out by calling them inept. I'm arguing these guys are very strategic, very clever. They're Fair. outsmarting us. Fair. And I, I don't think this is ineptness at all. And, 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 and I don't think this is, these aren't accidents, these aren't mistakes, these aren't well-intentioned. This is on purpose, intentional, it's eugenics, it's mm. uh, a genocide of black people. You go back to Margaret Sanger who started Planned Parenthood and was part of the eugenics movement, spoke yeah. to the KKK. The, the, we keep acting like, I'm just going to keep it a thousand percent real. Let's go. We keep acting like because maybe AOC will spread her legs for a black man. And I say maybe because she got a white man, uh, a white man for a boyfriend. But we keep acting like because she might or she got a friend who might that, oh, she's really on our team. Who else would party with us, do drugs with us, lay down with us? Uh it might be, you know, keep your enemies close or your, your, your friends close and your enemies closer or whatever. The, the very people that we think are our best friends mm. are the people killing us. Yes. And and we keep, oh, it's just an accident. Well, damn it, if every day, if, if they're killing me every day on accident, at some point, I, it, it can't just be an accident. And, and I, I say this, and Delano, I, I, I got to wrap up because I got to keep moving and, and I know we haven't, you know, I'm not gonna wrap up because I'm gonna let you talk about your R. Kelly column, but I just wanna make this one point, let you react to that, and then we'll talk about uh, the column you, you wrote about mm -hmm. R. Kelly and how it connects to all this. But, you know, this week, uh, a conservative friend of mine who is a Trump supporter invited me to, uh, his family's home for a meal mm -hmm. uh, and big, large gathering of people and uh, 50, 60 people inside this house for the meal. And there's a handful of five, six black people there as well. But but these are all what people would call these crazy Trump supporters or whatever. But what mm -hmm. I saw was some people that love God mm -hmm. and uh, what I experienced was some people that played, had a band come in and play gospel music, had a minister come in and <laughs> and talk about spiritual warfare. Mm. I, I, I saw some people that just like if 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 you love God, they love you, and they want to share what God has done for them with you and and see if you can experience it. And 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 I'm I was just sitting there and and because again I got friends across all political spectrums, mm -hmm. or I used to, and I still love my friends on the left. I'm not sure how they feel about me. They put some distance between themselves. But, but, but when I think about my friends on the left and what they have invited me to, mm -hmm. generally speaking, it, it, it revolves around some form of debauchery. And, and when I'm sitting here amongst 50, 60 people that have invited me to fellowship over food and talk about how God can work miracles in your life and, and provide a direction for you and true yeah. happiness or whatever. It, it, it's like, man, we got this whole thing messed up. And, yeah. and, and as black people, we have to snap out of this or we need to acknowledge we have no faith in God. We don't, we're not really Christian. What we are are cult members of the Democratic Party and we're cult members of the race religion and that race trumps everything for us. We would rather uh, be on the wrong side of God and on the right side of whatever the racial discussion of the day is and whatever Twitter tells us we should. Because <sighs> I'm just... This whole thing, the Super Bowl, the experiences I had this week, it's all just baffling and just makes me angry and just more wanting to be more honest and trying to just shake people up, man. We can't continue down this path. We cannot continue to be 
the useful idiots, the Trojan horses of mm -hmm. a satanic left movement that just wants to mainstream all forms of hedonism, materialism. Uh, you know, they're, they're really bringing back bigotry uh, and, and overt racism, except now everybody, oh, it's happy now because we get to be at the top of the black supremacy uh, mm. hatred religion. And I want no parts of that. Just like I didn't want no parts of the, the white supremacy movement, I don't want any parts of the black supremacy movement. So I say all that, you can respond to any of that or tell us a little bit about uh, your column today on R. Kelly and how it relates to our discussion today. Sure, I mean, it, it, it really does dovetail really nicely with, with what you wrote because I think at the end of the day, um, there are people who are willing to to sacrifice the the well-being, um, particularly of our women and girls, uh, to advance their own agenda, whether that is a political agenda or a financial agenda. So, so my piece on R. Kelly basically made the argument that the reason that he was able to operate with such you know impunity for so long um, is because for for many of us in the black community we see ourselves as primarily victims of a racist legal system as opposed to victims of, of you know, generally speaking, of violent crime. And in this case, victims of, you know, you know, sort of perverse perpetrators. So whether it's R. Victims Kelly, of disobedience to God. Let's try that one. But then go ahead. <laughs> so, so, so whether it's R. Kelly, O.J. Simpson, you know, um, Michael Jackson, Bill Cosby, you hear people say the same thing. Oh, they just they just trying to bring down another black man. People don't even ask themselves, OK, what is this person accused of? Right. Um, and OJ really crystallized it. And even though I was younger, I do remember the response. Even, you know, decades later, it was I think he did it, but I'm just I'm glad a black man got off. And for people who talk so much about justice, that is the most unjust um, position that one could take because it replaces the, the, the notion of, of justice, and I talked about this in my column earlier, right, particularly biblical justice, which is about the individual and, you know, holding them to the same standard as you would anyone, anyone else, and replaces it with social justice, which basically says, O.J. Simpson ever so slightly tips the scales back towards our favor because of all the black men who were railroaded by, you know, our racist system in years past. So even though, you know, he... he uh, likely decapitated his own his own ex-wife it's well at least a black man beat beat the rap and i guess that makes up you know for for guys who who didn't and i think the problem with r kelly um and, and i talked about this in the column is that our our sympathies consistently are misplaced uh, i talked about snoop in that column again pr protected from criticism because, you know, he's a black man and people don't want to see black man criticized or brought down by by the system, quote unquote. And this this also filters down to the streets. And I use the case of Micaiah Bryant um, as the perfect, you know, example of what this looks like in, in real time. And many people remember, tragically, she was shot and killed by a police officer in Columbus, Ohio. It was the same day that the, the Derek Chauvin verdict came down and people were saying, how could this continue to happen? And then the video came out and it showed that if that police officer had not shot Makai Bryant at that specific moment, she would have plunged a knife either into the, the, the head, the neck or the body of that woman in pink. And my argument is the black community is the woman in pink, because when that incident happened, Valerie Jarrett, Joy Reid, LeBron James, all the usual suspects came out and made it seem as if this was a, a case about white supremacy and racist policing and police misconduct. They never once asked themselves, what would have happened to that woman in pink if that police officer uh, had not taken the actions that he did? And in many respects, that perfectly epitomizes what they do, both in, in the culture and in the media. They step over the mangled and dead bodies of, of black folk in communities and cities all across this country in search of victims that they prefer. And that typically means someone who was harmed whether by words or by actions, by a white vigilante, a rude white woman, or the police. And I think, I hope that, that we as a community wake up to see what that is doing to, to, to our cities, right, and our neighborhoods. Um, this, this is a, a cultural cancer that has to be addressed 
and has to be removed because we can't go on to your point. We can't go on like that. And and seeing everything through the lens of race makes us particularly susceptible to, to this issue. So we're at a point now and to sort of tie in what we were talking about before, where there are a lot of black folk who will say, well, I can never vote Republican because I don't see anyone who looks like me. And my response would be, OK, so they may not look like you, but do they share your values. Because the people who do look like you are the ones who go down to the abortion clinic and they tell that young black girl who's who's on the fence about what she should do. You should you should kill your baby. You'll have a better life. You'll feel liberated. That's empowerment. And it's the white conservatives oftentimes. Right. If, if I'm making that distinction and drawing that dichotomy, they're the ones saying, no, you should keep your baby. Nothing will bring you as much fulfillment as becoming a parent. And we have got those two things confused. So now we sell abortion as as uh, black liberation and anti-abortion as white supremacy. And all of that ties into the same thing. One, as you said, we have we have abandoned our faith in God. And, and this is sort of a general critique you know, of, of our society. Um, and two, we have aligned our sympathies with perpetrators rather than victims. Um, and that's not any definition of justice that I've ever seen. Thank you, D. Great stuff you, as Jason. always. Uh, we'll be in touch. We'll see you next week, actually. All right. I want to tell you about my good friends over at Built Bar. You've seen me talk about how I'm fighting daily to lose weight, and it's working. And it's because Built Bar has been helping me. Built Bar is on Team Fearless. I need you to hop on Team Fearless by supporting Built Bar. See how that works? You guys can support the people and the products who support me and support the kind of content that you enjoy. Plus, when it comes to Built Bar, you're going to be blown away by the taste, the low sugar count, the low calories, and how it helps your health improve. Built Bar is the perfect solution for those of you that like me that need a little snack, a little pick-me-up in the middle of the day, and you want to do it in a way that fits your health goals and needs. Go to built.com, use the promo code FEARLESS to save 15% off your first order. Use the promo code FEARLESS, support built.com, support Built Bars because they're supporting me and the content and the products that you like. Use the promo code FEARLESS for 15% off at built.com. All right, welcome back. Time to talk a little sports with our main. Not that we weren't talking sports with Delano. We were talking about the Super Bowl halftime, but uh, time to roll out to Los Angeles and bring in uh, Steve Kim, uh, our main man, our Asian brother from Uncle Jimmy's mother, I think. Oh, that's probably not the Whoa. right thing to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably not. I, I, I probably regret that. But Steve, uh, I want to get your initial thoughts on my thoughts about the Super Bowl halftime. You live out in Los Angeles. You're probably a Dr. Dre groupie, Snoop Dogg groupie. Uh, you can't wait to say <laughs> and the N-word uh, Whoa, all Jim, during the Super Bowl Jackson. halftime. I'm, I'm sure. Go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm I'll sorry. be honest with you. Even though I am from the quote unquote West Side, right, right around their ascension is when I started to kind of move West away side. from hip hop. Oh, God, I hate that. You know, here's the interesting thing. I was thinking about what you and Delano were talking about, and I read your monologue. Two things. Number one, they're talking about uh, this particular halftime being this cultural touchstone or the landing of the moon. Do Prince and Michael Jackson not count? Because I thought those were the two most memorable. They weren't black. Enough. They weren't black. Enough. Not black enough, no. And the other one. They didn't say the the N-word enough to be really considered black. So go ahead. Right. and the other thing is, the greatest halftime show was ever was on Fox when In Living Color did the thing with men on football. Remember, they did their own halftime show back in the early 90s? And it was real funny because the punchline was our two favorite teams are the Packers and the Oilers, and they took a snap and not from shotgun. That So, Damon Wayans, if you're out there, please rescue <laughs> the NFL Super Bowl halftime show. Okay, we need you. The, the, the other thing that's really ironic about hip-hop, and I used to be an avid fan of it like you, and I think a lot of the similar reasons – that I moved away from it 
uh, mirror yours. Look, I'm a suburban kid, so I'm not going to try to become a suburban gangster here. I am what I am. I grew up in a neighborhood with a cul-de-sac. Uh, I never tried to be anything that I'm not. I'm actually very proud of my middle class heritage that my parents provided for me. But it, it got very dark and gruesome, and it almost became uh, pornographic violence, if you will. But here's what I, I found to be very uh, interesting about hip hop. Now, starting to think about it after reading your column today and your fire starter in the late 80s, when you could really cover as mainstream media, urban crime, drive by shootings, murders, gang violence, that two sets of rappers from the East Coast and West Coast each made a song denouncing this saying, hey, let's be better. It was the East Coast rappers. And I think their song was called Self-Destruction. And then the West Coast rappers came yep. out, I think, a year later with we're all in the same gang. You know, it was a very positive message, yep. like, let's cut the madness. There used to be a time that hip hop was a thought leader, not just for the black community, for everybody. You can learn stuff from it. And as the rise of this type of hip hop that you denounce, and I kind of agree with Jason, is the fact that, believe it or not, Rock Kim, Public Enemy, Poor Righteous Teachers, anyone that was really conscious or educated simply did not have room in that realm. And they got relegated. And there was a point when I grew up that many of the hip-hop artists actually not only went to high school and graduated, they went to college. And it was not a bad thing. Now, if you admit that you have a degree, I, it almost ruins your career. Listen, I, I sit here, there, there was a rap group called the College Boys. I own their yeah. album or their CD. Uh, and, and I've written about the pivot in hip-hop numerous times. and. I do think it was calculated and people love, it's like when they made the movie about NWA, look, I was the first guy on Ball State's campus with NWA's first album. And I can, and, you know, I had the virus in terms of, you know, like I love the music and was passing it around. And, and, but people have this reimagined view of what that music was because F the police was on there and everyone, all oh, that. They were this revolutionary group that stuck it to the establishment. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Go listen to the album and go write down what the message is from every song in there. And it's all highly negative, highly profane, highly degrading towards black people, women, uh, promotes violence towards black men. Again, N.W.A. did one song, F the Police, that you know is exaggerated its impact and its social conscience and all this other stuff but the rest of that music is is hot garbage it's like this morning i listened to uh uh dre's one less bitch and, <laughs> and i'm just like how in this era of me too is dr dre doing halftime is harvey weinstein going to produce it <laughs> I mean, literally, because I can guarantee you this, if Dr. Dre was white, they wouldn't let him escape all that baggage and all those lyrics. In 2015, he comes out with Compton, and, and Eminem is talking about even the girls I rape. He said it. I'm, mm. just, I'm just keeping it real. This is who we're putting on at halftime. That's why I'm using the actual words, the actual lyrics. Because I just I want it in people's face because we're trying to sanitize this, and it's a joke. Let me keep it moving, though. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Thursday night's game, just briefly. Urban Meyer, I, did, I wish I had tweeted it at the time, because now it's just like revisionist history. But I was saying at the time, kick the field goal yes. for 58 seconds, right before half. You have a chance to go up three scores and you're a winless team. And it, it, you know, look, if there had been five minutes left, four minutes left in the half, I would go for it because now you're pinning the guys back and they punch you the ball and you get another shot at it. But with that little time, you kick the field goal and you go up three scores and the whole, I said, this is gonna come back to bite them in the rear. So I wish I had tweeted it so I'd have proof, but that's what I was thinking. And, and it just, I thought that was a mistake of greed. And, uh, you know, I, I, how do you feel about Urban Meyer after last night's game? Well, again, I, I want to check his heart rate. And I agree with you. 
in a situation like that. But that's the difference, though, Jason, between coaching in a dominant program like Florida and Ohio State, where you always have the talent advantage, or being at a really bad football team. You're right. If you're a really bad football team like Jacksonville is, going up 17 nothing at the half is huge. Now, when you're playing Ohio State and you've got nine NFL guys on both sides of the ball playing Minnesota or a team of that ilk of Maryland, you could be very, very reckless and bold. And he learned something, that in the National Football League, every point counts because, you know, it's interesting. I didn't realize this. I started watching the Red Zone a lot uh, several years ago. If you go into the fourth quarter of most games, so the first block of games in the morning, at least on the West Coast, there's like 8 to 10. Most of those games, Jason, it's, and they mentioned this on the broadcast, are all within 7 to 10 points. It's not like college where you see like a, uh, just a swath of blowouts for the most part, where it's a 24-point game, 35-point game. Most NFL games going into the last 15 minutes are right in that 7 to 10-point range, which means don't waste possession. And it's really a shame because as soon as they got stuffed on that fourth and goal from the one-yard line, you could almost feel the momentum shifting in that ball game. Uh, let's move on to the biggest game of the weekend and maybe the biggest game of the regular season. Tom Brady versus Bill Belichick uh, in New England. I think a lot of people are, are now trying to diminish Bill Belichick and, and say that, you know, Tom Brady was the driving factor and Bill Belichick has lost his fastball. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but uh, I, I do think Tampa Bay is probably going to win, and that narrative is going to continue. Uh, has your view of Bill Belichick changed since the departure of Tom Brady? No, I am a huge Bill Belichick advocate. I believe he's one of the greatest coaches that ever lived. His mug should be right on the Mount Rushmore of NFL coaches, right, us, right alongside guys like Vince Lombardi. And talk about revisionist history. And again, I am not taking away the greatness of Tom Brady. He's in the Mount Rushmore quarterbacks. But let's go back throughout the history of the Super Bowl dynastic run of the Patriots, which, which was amazing because it literally lasted 17, 18 years. But Jason, am I not wrong in recalling this, that the first two, if not three Super Bowls, Tom Brady was more or less a very good, glorified game manager and the Patriots were defined by their defense because Belichick was an incredible defensive mind with the New York Giants. And when you thought of those Patriots, it was Teddy Bruschi, Willie McGinnis, and Ty Law. And then it wasn't until 2007 when Randy Moss came aboard and they had a record-setting year that the second half of that run was also then defined by Tom Brady and explosive offenses that they went to more of a spread set. They got Wes Welker and it changed a lot of different things. So, but let's go back a couple years ago. Um, the last Super Bowl that Tom Brady won with the Patriots, the score was 13 to 3, which meant that the defense more or less won that game. And if you go back, and I think that game was in Atlanta, Jared Goff had a high flying offense. His plays were being called in by Sean McVay. But you know what? They tried to play chess with Bobby Fisher Belichick, and they got checkmated. So, yes, it helps having a great quarterback, but this whole revisionist history that somehow Belichick was just along for the ride, I think is patently false. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, think, I don't remotely want to diminish Tom Brady because I think the guy is terrific. I think what he stands for, his leadership, the, the way he allowed Belichick to coach, I think all of that is indisputable, and Tom Brady has every right to be championed as the GOAT of professional football. Although, in my view, John Elway is. But I don't have a problem with people that think otherwise and, and give that to Brady, because he certainly deserves it. I do want to say, though, that I believe any reasonable, objective, hardcore view of Brady would say he's dominated the softest era Yes. of NFL football when, when they you know he remember when his knee got hurt by Kansas City Chief I think Bernard Pollard and they basically illegalized hitting quarterbacks in the knee and and so the, the NFL over the course of Brady's 20 plus year career has just gotten softer and softer and softer receivers can run over the middle 
without much fear of getting their heads taken off the way they used to be able to. And, and, and it's quarterbacks can't be touched and all that. And so of this very soft era of NFL football, Tom Brady is by far the greatest. If he had to play during Elway's time or Terry Bradshaw's time or some of the guys, that, I, I'm not sure if, if he would put up the numbers and have had the success that he's had, not knocking the guy, but I do think Belichick, uh, reputations unscathed regardless of what happens this Sunday or what happens the rest of Belichick's career. Brady goes on and wins two more Super Bowls in Tampa. Hats off to him. If Belichick never wins another Super Bowl, I still love Bill Belichick. I still love Tom Brady. Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you some college football stuff. Uh, and and I'm not, I'm not going to start with Alabama Ole Miss. I I think Notre Dame's going to beat Cincinnati. I think Cincinnati's overvalued. Steve Kim says what? To a degree, you're right, but Notre Dame's not that good either. I mean, they struggle with an FSU team that still has not won. They pulled away from Wisconsin. They nearly lost to Toledo. This is a game where the Cincinnati season comes down to a three-and-a-half block on NBC uh, for Desmond Ritter to really ma- leave his mark on college football and Luke Fickle to become – the next head coach at USC or whatever program wants to pay him seven, eight million dollars. Notre Dame is going to be interesting if they have their quarterback, Jack Cohn, got injured, banged up. Offense didn't really seem to leave a beat without him. He's very, very immobile. A lot of interesting storylines here. Brian Kelly had a great run at Cincinnati. Marcus Freeman, the Cincinnati defensive coordinator, is now at Notre Dame. Uh, I don't know how good Notre Dame is. I've seen a several other games. And outside of pulling away from Wisconsin late last week in Soldier Field, they have not looked like a top 10 team. Um, and we'll see. Cincinnati's playoff, their hopes and dreams all come down basically to this game. It's fascinating. Lane Kiffin can stamp himself as legitimate by beating Alabama and Nick Saban this weekend. And ba- to me, erase all the jokes about Lane Kiffin. (laughs) I I think Lane Kiffin's a good coach. I I don't know if he's up for beating Alabama, but he's got a hell of an opportunity this weekend to stamp himself as, you know, to erase some of the memes and some of the jokes about his past. I'll say this. I think it's already happened. Last year in a game that I don't think a lot of people watched during the lockout, they went neck and neck, punch for punch with Alabama and eventually lost 63-48. They just couldn't stop a leaky faucet defensively. But Lane Kiffin changed the course of Alabama football. And I give Nick Saban credit because he evolved as a great coach. Back in the first national title or two with the Crimson Tide, they were largely a pro-set power running team that would set up play action. Nick Saban understood where the game was going, it was more to spread sets, more a little bit more up-tempo. Lane Kiffin helped begin that process, and Lane is a brilliant play caller. I saw it at SC when he was a young coach alongside Steve Sarkeesian and Norm Chow at USC. You know, I remember about seven, eight years ago, someone brought up to the fact, how do you think Lane Kiffin would do it in Miami? And I nearly vomited at the thought. I'll say this, Lane Kiffin right now, I would take him off the airplane tarmac, not to fire him, but to beg him to come to the U. I actually believe from an offensive standpoint, he used to be a pro set guy too at USC when they had Matt Leinart and Mike Williams and Reggie Bush. But he has evolved. And what I like about him is that he has grown. That when he first got these jobs, and I think there was some nepotism. You might even call it white coaching privilege because of his father. He got jobs way too early. He wasn't built for it. He was not mature. But it's like that classic movie with Chris Farley, Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy at the beginning was an absolute mess. He he, he couldn't get out of his own way. But at the end of the movie, he became a great leader. He could run a company. That right now is Lane Kiffin. Who do you think wins? The game is at Tuscaloosa. I'm going to go with the chalk. I'm going to say 45-31 Crimson Tide. And Steve, did you see Mike Wilbon go after Lane Kiffin? Lane retweeted it or whatever. Did did you see that? And what 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 do you think of Wilbon's attack on Kiff? Oh, explain that to me. What exactly was his beef with him? I I don't know. It just seemed like he was just attacking Lane Kiffin, kind of for 
no reason. I, I like Mike, but it, it it's came off as more a shtick or just like, hey, this is an easy person I can attack. Here's someone safe I can beat up. But Kiffin retweeted it and, you know, kind of had a all shucks or just like, what's up with this guy reaction to it. And so Lane Kiffin's very confident. I'll, I'll just <laughs> I'll say that. And a bit self-deprecating, good personality. L- let me let me ask you another media question since you didn't mm-hmm. see that, uh, because you are our, our resident media expert. Uh, Mark Lamont Hill uh, mm. hospitalized this week with a heart attack after making fun of Jonathan Isaac and his position on uh, COVID. Uh, you know, fully vaccinated Mark Lamont having some blood clot issues, but he said it's all from an Achilles surgery. What, what's your reaction to Le- Mark Lamont Hill, uh, perhaps karma, giving him a visit? Don't you mean Mark Lamont Shill? I, I mean, Q Alanis <laughs> Moore, a thousand spoons when all you need is a knife, you know, a death row pardon a minute too late. Here's the thing. First of all, I hope he recovers. I, I don't ish, wish ill health on anybody. I think it's terrible when, when people do that just because you're on the different side of the political spectrum or the street. But he wrote a tweet basically saying about Jonathan Isaac that this sounds smart to people who don't know anything. In other words, calling them dumb. Mark, you literally said that males can get pregnant and you were serious about it. You're the last guy that should be making comments about people's biology or anatomy. So like Nell Carter once said, give me a break. I don't know if you remember that show, Jimmy. I lo- uh, J- Jason, I love that show. Remember that one? Remember that one? Why you keep show? calling me Jimmy? I don't know why. Why you keep calling me Jimmy? I don't know, because he's the real star of this show. Oh, and by the way, Jason, I want to yeah. t- tell you one thing. Uh, I hope yeah. we have time. Yeah. I, one of my readers uh, is more of a boxing fan. He's a person of color that works in the medical field. Saw our segment on Isaac and Kyrie Irving, and he had a disagreement with me. He said, Steve, I want to tell you this right now. I would not dismiss Kyrie. He's actually a better spokesman for this than Jonathan Isaac, because he's the one that's in the major media market. He's an all-star player. He's the one with shoes. He's the one with real influence, and he has no ties to the right wing or to being Trump. He's the one that's pro-black. His message will resonate much louder and further than Jonathan Isaac. And he happens to be a medical professional in New York who in two weeks may not have a job because he's one of the medical workers in that field that is pushing back against the vaccine mandate. And that's a story that's not being told is a lot of people in the medical field. Again, it's one thing to question Jason Whitlock and I that we're not doctors, we're not in the medical field. I get it. My best friend who I'm gonna be spending all day uh, tomorrow watching college football, he's in the fire department on the medical side. He even tells me that a lot of people that work in hospitals that are in that industry, they are hesitant also. So to just cast Jonathan Isaac as this nut job who's bought into right wing politics, I, I look at that as being completely dishonest. Jason, Jason. Uh, Steve, I'm going to give you two more minutes because I want you to I want your take on one other big news in the media world. People ask me to comment on it. I chose not to because I've already stated my opinion in full. <laughs> Uh-oh. But uh, Katie Nolan is out at ESPN, and I just saw an article in The Guardian today that said that you know ESPN made a tragic mistake not building their entire network around Katie Nolan. She, you know, and at one point, I mean, years ago, she, I think it was Variety or GQ or someone called her the future of sports television. Uh, Katie Nolan no longer at uh, ESPN. Uh, your thoughts? <sighs> This reminds me of that, I want to draw an analogy to baseball. A guy hits 270 at age 22, and people think this is going to be the next Tony Gwynn, and they sign him to like an eight-year contract. Two years into it, you're like, oh, geez, we just got a 270 hitter. This ain't Tony Gwynn. I'll give Katie Nolan credit for this. A couple years ago, a show that I watch religiously, because I'm a football guy, is NFL Films Presents, and she was the host. She was actually very good at that. She was cute. She was funny. She actually knew her football, big Patriots fan. It worked. She was a good host. ESPN, I don't know what they thought they were getting. And I remember watching a small snippet of her show on ESPN Plus where she hosted her own show. It didn't work. It it just, I don't don't want to say it was like the magic hour with Magic Johnson uh, because no one really cared about it. But it was just bad. And you're you're just kind of like, it's all these forced jokes. You had these writers. And every time she'd do a punchline, 
everyone would kind of laugh nervously because I guess we're supposed to laugh. I, you know, a pet peeve of mine was people say, Steve, want to hear something funny? It's almost like they're forcing you to laugh if it's not funny. And that was the thing with Katie Nolan. It's like she never really said anything funny. She always stayed in this like political or sociological sphere. So she wasn't allowed to be funny. And she's one of these people that wags the finger at people for not supporting women's sports. And I remember when you battled with her last year and you wrecked her. Um, if you go and someone pointed this out, if you look at her social media posts, she's never at WNBA games. And I, I thought right there she lost a lot of credibility. So I have no ill will to Katie Nolan. I think she fits a particular role. She's good at certain things, but ESPN picked up a bill of goods in a sense that she wasn't capable of fulfilling what they thought they were getting. That's what I would say about it. Jason. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Have a good weekend. All right, you too. All right, now I get to talk about my favorite. I love eating, I love food, I love good ranchers. And you need to love good ranchers too because they love me and they love this show. And because they love America, they love American farmers, they love the best grass-fed beef uh, that's produced in the world. It's done right here in America. You should be supporting Good Ranchers. They got all the meat, seafood, chicken, shrimp, whatever you want, they got it. But more than that, people ask me all the time, they realize we're in a culture war. They realize that this show rages against uh, the people trying to destroy this country. And they ask me, hey, wh what can I do? What can I do? You can support good ranchers. You can support the people that are supporting me and this platform. That's what you can do. You're going to eat. You like steak. You like chicken. You like good meat. Why not spend it with a business and a company that likes and supports you and your point of view? That's why you need to hop on board with Good Ranchers. If you subscribe, you'll get $20 off and free express shipping. Get steakhouse quality for less than $5 per meal. You're going to eat. Why not eat something really good that saves you money and supports America and the point of view that you support? I need you to do this. I need you to go to GoodRanchers.com slash fearless to get $20 off and free express shipping. I need you to support the people that are supporting me and you and the point of view that we believe in, the people fighting for this country. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash fearless right now. All right, welcome back. Jason Whitlock here, Fearless with Jason Whitlock. We're gonna roll out to Iowa and talk with uh, one of the best experts, or the best expert, I believe, on COVID, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. And, uh, but as I give Steve Dace this praise, the host of uh, the Steve Dace Show on Blaze uh, TV, I also have to uh, say that Steve is also uh, the worst handicapper I believe in uh, all of sports. Uh, Steve keeps sending me really bad picks, and I said the next time I got him on this show, I was gonna call him out because he's cost my mother a vacation that I had promised her uh, with some of his picks. And so uh, if I ask Steve for any picks here while I have him here as a guest, make sure you play the opposite, fade. I'm gonna call it Steve Fade is what we're gonna call him. Uh, Steve Fade, uh, welcome to the show. It's the great prophet Ice Cube once said, brother, you can't fade me, okay? But uh, that, that notwithstanding, I won week one. You're only asking for one pick. I did win week one. Granted, the last two weeks, let's just say I won week one. Yes. We will say that. All right, you've written an update, a new chapter to your book, The Fauci and uh, Bargain. Uh, it's called The Fauci and Booster. Uh, so you've provided a booster to your book and a new chapter. What's your new chapter about? 
It's about the fight against vaccine mandates, uh, Jason, why they're unethical, why they're immoral, uh, particularly in the case of COVID-19. And when we finished Fauci and Bargain, the, the vaccine rollout was just beginning. And in, in the early months of the rollout, the data was very good up against the alpha variants, particularly in, in high risk and elderly uh, categories. So we just thought we would just leave the book here and then wait for a few months and, and see what transpired. Well, what's happened basically since about the middle of July is the vaccine data all over the world has collapsed. Uh, and it's because of, uh, primarily that winds up with the ascendancy of Delta variant. There may be some, some other factors involved as well, but D Delta seems to be the MacGuffin here that's causing or at least provoking this. And, and of course, because this has been, Jason, what we've seen for the last you know, 19 months, the less something shows to work, the more they want to impose it. So in, this, in, the, in the spring and in, this, in the early summer when the vaccines were doing well, no one talked about vaccine mandates. It's only after they began to collapse, especially from a transmission efficacy standpoint, that now they want to mandate these. And so we went back and looked at the Nuremberg Code, which was established after World War II when the Allies become, became fully um, informed on what was truly going on uh, within Nazi Germany from a human experimentation and a scientific advancement standpoint, uh, where they had taken the country that was maybe the most advanced nation in the world pre-World War I and turned it into a jackbooted authoritarian island of Dr. Moreau. And they issued what was called the Nuremberg Code so that stuff like this would never happen again. And if you look at the very first uh, you know, prime directive, the first statement, there's 10 of them in the, in the Nuremberg Code, it talks about informed consent for human subjects, uh, understanding truly what it is that uh, you are lining up for, what you are going to be uh, injecting or taking into your body. This violates every single syllable of that. And we break that down in Fauci and Booster because we don't think the people making these decisions, Jason, we don't think they care about the Constitution. So we're trying to appeal to a, a higher law, a Hippocratic oath, Judeo-Christian notions of what is and isn't proper when trying to advance science as opposed to doing so at all costs. What do you say to the people that one will say, well, Steve is anti-vax and he doesn't care about the safety and health of all of us. And we are the world and everybody's got to take the vax because it's better for all of us. What do you say to those people? I, I, I think a lot of these terms that get thrown around just don't mean anything anymore. Um, you know, I, I have people I work with and around me that would be considered, quote unquote, anti-vaxxers. And in the past, you know, I even have employees who are anti-vaxxers. And you know why I was never really concerned about it, Jason? Wait for it. Wait for it. Because um, I was vaccinated, you know. So if they have particular concerns or views, they see links to autism and things like that. And I, you know, I, my, my assistant, Todd, who is co-author of this chapter in my book, uh, he's an anti-vaxxer. He has sit ne sat next to me for the last six years, nearly uh, 200 times a year. Why have I not been concerned about it? Because I'm vaccinated. Uh, about eight years ago, I went and uh, did a mission trip to Haiti, the poorest country in our hemisphere. And, and I didn't do some I work in the media celebrity photo op. I mean, we did the hardcore food for the poor places you've got to hike to. And before I went, the Obama State Department mandated to go to Haiti. I had to update all my traditional vaccine cocktail and boosters from my childhood in order to admit me back in the country. So I did. Now, how come even after spending over a week in one of the most devastated countries in the world, the worst in our hemisphere, how come I was allowed back into the U.S.? They were not concerned that I would bring that devastation back with me because I was vaccinated. So I don't understand why a bunch of vaccinated people are concerned about people that are not. You're basically undermining your own case, number one. But number two, this really does come down to a personal decision now, Jason, because even Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC, she admitted to Wolf Blitzer on CNN back on August the 5th that these COVID vaccines don't stand up against transmission anymore. So if we're not having an argument anymore about if I'm not vaccinated, I could give it to somebody else, but that really these are strictly like a flu shot, a therapeutic, then that's really and truly a personal decision now. The idea that we would mandate something that doesn't stop the spread of something. And if you look at all the data around the world, right now, 75% of Americans have had at least one dose of vaccine, Jason. We have 156% more cases. We have 148% more deaths this time 
than we did this time last year when there was nobody vaccinated. In the UK, over about 70% of all citizens are vaccinated there. They have 432% higher case rates case rate right now than they did at this time last year. Vermont's the most vaccinated state in our country. It has the highest case rate it has ever had right now, and it's not even in season for them yet. Maine is also one of the highest vaccinated states in our country. They have the highest ICU admission rate they've ever had right now. And again, it's not quite yet seasonality in the North. So these things do not stymie on a mass population basis. They do not thwart or stymie transmission. And so if that is the case, if I'm not a super spreader. And then, by the way, there was a study from the University of Wisconsin last week. They looked at two of the biggest counties in the state and found that when somebody vaccinated tested positive for COVID, they actually had a slightly higher viral load than when somebody unvaccinated tested positive for COVID. So if, if, if I can spread this, whether I'm vaccinated or not, then I have then there is no moral or ethical position that justifies mandating these, especially, Jason, when you consider that Moderna has, by, by efficacy numbers, they have the vaccine that produces the most amount of antibodies. And yet, this is the first time Moderna has ever successfully brought a, a product to market. They had previously been 0 for 9. Big pharmaceutical companies never even uh, invested in heavily in messenger RNA technology till 2008. This is the first time we've ever mass injected populations around the world with this technology. It's ex it's the very <clears throat> definition of experimentation, Jason. So if they don't stymie transmission and it's an experimentation, brother, you tell me what is the justification for mandating people take these? Because I don't see it. So, Steve, uh, I know that if not for a tragic skateboard accident, you would have played in the NBA. <laughs> so let me ask you this hypothetical question. Right. If you had a 23-year-old son who was in the NBA and in peak physical condition, like, say, perhaps a Jonathan Isaac, a Bradley Beal, uh, what advice would you give your 23-year-old son in peak condition? And maybe your 23 has no kids, but, you know, wants to get married and have kids. What advice would you give him about the vaccine mandate or about taking about the vaccine? Uh, Jason, if I had a daughter in that age group and she was either pregnant or wanted to be in the next year, I would tell her not to do it based on the data I've looked at. If I had a son in that age group um, and they were healthy, like you said, it had no pre-existing conditions like a, a, you know, the type of diabetes you're born with, not the type you give yourself chronically with bad lifestyle choices, then I would also tell them not to do it because everything is a risk assessment. My friend, everything is. We don't know. I mean, the, the more and more we learn, the more and more likely it is that the best we're going to say about the origin of this virus is that it leaked accidentally out of that lab. And they were and that it's some form of chimeric experiment, meaning a, a Frankenstein's monster. We don't even know that it's not a bioweapon. We have absolutely no idea. And that means that we don't know what the risk for a, even an, a, the long term risk is for even an asymptomatic exposure to a to the coronavirus we don't know that we also don't know what the long-term risk is for injecting the nanoparticles of this messenger rna technology into now almost six billion people we have no idea what the long-term ramifications are for that either everybody here is taking a risk no one here is walking away thinking like i got this you're not you're everybody's risking something here and that means we really ought to be practicing maximum grace and empathy right now uh, and, and, you know, you wrote a column the other day for The Blaze that I, that, that I think you said something along the lines of, well, I took the risk, so you have to. And I think that is driving a lot of this, the idea that you have to have the same, uh, you know, uh, uh, response to something as me. Idolatry makes fools and cowards of us all, and that is far more of a premium in our culture today than information is. And so this really ought to be a period in time where we're really coming together as a society and realizing we truly are all in this together. We didn't do this to ourselves. China and probably Anthony Fauci's NIAID did this to us. And therefore, this is the perfect time, like a Pearl Harbor moment. We band together and, sacri and sacrifice together and game plan this out together on how to get through it. Instead, what's happened is we have become even more balkanized and even more authoritarian. And those are very bad long-term signs for the future of this culture or lack thereof. 
Steve, a lot of people will hear what you just said about coming together and they'll take that as an argument. Yeah, what Steve is arguing, we all need to take the vaccine. That's our sacrifice. Take this risk. I did. And it's unfair that I took this risk and you're not going to do it. We all, it, again, it's, it sounds like the message Jim Jones preached in right. Guyana. We all got to yeah. do it together. We all got to drink this Kool-Aid. That's how we come together. What do you say to that? I mean, that sounds like a, a chapter in a left behind book. Uh, but first of all, if the vaccine is so great, why are you worried about the risk you took? Number one. But, but number two, there's things we still don't know. We have millions and millions of people like myself who have documented, uh, you know, former infections they've recovered from what we used to call natural immunity. What Israel did, they, they looked at uh, tens of thousands of their own patients in a study just a couple of months ago. And what they found was that those who had a, who had recovered from a previous COVID infection or what we used to call natural immunity, they were 13 times less likely to get COVID again than somebody who was vaccinated was, that they were 27 times less likely to get a severe COVID infection than somebody vaccinated was. Any day now, I've seen a preprint of it. Any day now, the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the most prestigious medical centers in the country, right up there with the Mayo Clinic, they're gonna release a study of their own employees within their own healthcare system that found no one in their healthcare system over the course of a six month period of monitoring them that was known to have recovered from COVID, then ended up getting it after uh, recovering and having antibodies from a natural infection. Why do we deny this natural immunity? Why? Because here's the thing we don't know. We have no idea what happens if we take these spike proteins from these mRNA vaccines and re-inject them into the bodies of billions of people who are, or millions of people who already have natural immunity. Will we make it worse for them? Will that cause even higher side effects? Folks, it has, we spent almost 15 years trying to come up with a vaccine for the first SARS, and we failed at this. We have spent hundreds of years trying to come up with a vaccine for a, a, a real immunization for cold, for flu. The only virus we've ever truly wiped out through vaccination was smallpox. I mean, this is hard to do. The idea that we were going to come up with something foolproof with a technology that's never been tried no matter how much uh, warp speed and money we put into it, and this thing was going to be completely locked down and foolproof in a, in a year plus, is simply just not realistic. Everybody here is taking a risk. Somebody who's unvaccinated is taking a risk. And I'll, I'll say this, and I've said this to my own audience, Jason. If you, I've urged my audience, everyone in my, and I'll do the same with yours. Everyone watching and listening right now, you need to go get antibody tested. And if you can in your in your area, you need to get what's called a T-cell test. And this is sort of the long-term immunity that your body holds on to, like its own cloud system, when it doesn't think that it needs to have antibodies in your, in your hemoglobin anymore. It stores it in your cellular memory. And you need to know for sure if you have had a documented case of COVID that you just didn't know about or was asymptomatic, because the virus is worse this year. It is hitting younger people harder this year. It is hitting younger men harder this year. It is more pathogenic than it was at this time last year. Now, there could be a lot of different reasons for that, but the data is what it is. And so if you have no protection at all, then I think you need to consider that your risk calculation with these vaccines is not the same as it was last year when maybe you just looked at all that age stratified data and said, you know what, I got, I'll take my chances with the virus. It's a, lot, uh, it, 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 it's a lot further along than it is with these vaccines. And I say this as somebody who is staunchly opposed to mandates, but I'm staunchly opposed to mandates for the same reason why I'm urging people to really do their homework on this, even if it means taking the vaccine, because I care about people. That's why. So one of the things that's disconcerting to me is there's all the COVID paranoia and talk of vaccine mandates. And you and I are both huge football fans, college and pro. And I see these stadiums packed and people yelling. And it's like, People are moving on with their lives, it appears to me, in great numbers. But it also seems like the Biden administration and the left are moving on with their determination to have these mandates and to have two separate classes of citizens here in America, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Who wins this battle, in your view, are we going to have vaccine mandates 
are, are enough people going to be like, man, I've had it. We're, we're going on with life. And, you know, I, I may get struck by lightning. I may get hit by a car. I may get hit by a drunk driver. I may get hit by COVID, but I got to keep on living. Who, who wins this battle? You know, you've talked a lot the last couple of years about this idea of creating a two-tiered society, us versus them, certain classes of people that get a government privilege that others don't have, and how that creates such a divisive society. And what this has done for this, what COVID presents for the spirit of the age, not everybody's black, not everybody's gay, not everybody's a woman, not everybody's Hispanic, but everybody cares about their health. And this has created an opportunity for them within the spirit of the age there to use an issue to create the ultimate apartheid system, to create the ultimate two-tiered system. The reality is that if you're black or Hispanic and voted for Joe Biden, there is a much statistically a much higher likelihood that you are unvaccinated than if you go to church every week and you're white and you voted for Donald Trump. That's just the facts of the demographics. And yet the way this constant uh, this 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 tension is constantly framed is these are all just Trump voters because they're dying literally dying in order to create this sort of two-tiered apartheid system. This is the greatest this is the greatest power grab, multinational power grab peaceably without tanks in the streets that we've ever seen in the history of Western civilization. And I think for this to be defeated ultimately, because they're not going to stop. This is the moment they have been waiting decades for this moment for some form of a, a great reset. They're even using phrases. I used to tell my audience, don't say things like new world order out loud. It makes us look like freaks. These, these guys on the left, they just say this stuff out loud now, okay? Without any shame, I've got a column up at The Blaze today in which I point out, Jason, that movie villains have to lie. They've got to trick you about what their true nefarious plots are. Nowadays, these Fargan bastages just say it out loud. And so they just call their shot like Babe Ruth in the world in the 32 series, man. Yeah, man, we're masking your kids for Evs, choking them out, and we're injecting them at six years old to go to school in California. How do you like them apples? They just say it out loud. I mean, and, and so this is going to be a battle of political will, brother. Ultimately, we're not a nation of laws and we never have been. We are a nation of political will and we always will be. Whoever has the stronger will here to prevail, meaning that within the Christian worldview, this is why there's virtue in suffering. All right. Are you willing to suffer for what you believe? The civil rights movement suffered in full view of cameras all over Amer middle America under high pressure water hoses in the 60s and forced people living in places like Ohio and Illinois that didn't care about the segregated Jim Crow South and, and, and forced them to, to come to grips with it, forced them to say, you know what, I'm going to call my congressman, make that stop. I don't want to watch that over the TV dinners with my kids anymore. They understood that suffering actually forces change. The apostles did this. This is how the early church basically conquered the Roman Empire. See, the other side is willing to suffer for what it believes in, and it's really willing to make you and I suffer for what it believes in. If we're not willing to lose some jobs, lose some businesses, lose some friends, lose some YouTube accounts, we're toast because the stronger will will prevail. Awesome job, Steve. You just rolled us right into the weekend. <laughs> you rolled us right into tomorrow singing about freedom, which is appropriate. Love you, brother. Talk soon. Thank you, Don't man. send me any pics this weekend. <laughs> I need to save some money. You got it, brother. Take care.